This video is sponsored by PCBWay. Hello my goblins and ghouls, my name is Steven. The last few weeks have been all about preparing for motherboard production. If you're new here, I started a company around selling my open source pick and place. You can click here for the whole saga and catch up. Last time I got into panelized versions of the motherboard and the ring lights, so I'm all set to start populating, right? Well, not quite. There is still a ton to do around setting up a mid-scale PCBA production line. Right out of the gate, the first thing that Lucian and I did was figure out a layout in the shop that's gonna be really conducive towards manufacturing circuit boards. Thinking about the flow of materials and power and information and finished products, how are things going to move through the line the most smoothly that they can? We basically broke it down by the three main steps of SMT assembly. The first is applying solder paste. Lucian and I moved the shelf of this rack way up high so that the one underneath kind of acts as a little bit of extra desk space. And this is where we're gonna actually set up the solder paste stencils. There are some really cool jigs out there that you can mount your solder paste stencil into and it keeps your board indexed really well in the jig and you bring it down and it lines up every time. We are looking into getting one of these for the near future, mainly for the motherboard. So if you have a recommendation of one that you really like and you've used in the past, please drop a link in the comments. I'd love to see what you've been using and hear about your experience using it. But for now, we're gonna use the classic old surround your PCB with old PCBs trick to align the board and make sure you get a good solder paste stencil application. This is honestly a really good way to have your board pop into the exact same place relative to your stencil over and over again. And it makes sure that the surface upon which you're squeegeeing solder paste is the exact same height as your board because it's also made out of circuit boards. A little bit of double-sided tape holds it down super well and it does the job. But we are still looking to get a nicer jig, especially for the motherboards where the precision is much more important for getting all those tiny little components on there. The ring lights, it's a little bit more flexible because we're pretty much just populating addressable LEDs and a couple passives, so it's not nearly as important. But for the motherboard, I think we wanna get a nice jig. So this whole shelf is just for solder paste and SMT storage. Up top, we have storage for the extra stencils and some of the tools that we need, like the squeegees for applying the paste. This shelf here is mainly just for having space to actually apply the paste and everything underneath is storage for SMT components for the ring lights and for the motherboards. We're even looking into getting one of those tiny fridges that you can get for makeup. Apparently like you need to keep some makeup cold and you can buy a little tiny fridge just for makeup, which is perfect for keeping solder paste cold out here in the shop. I didn't wanna to have to buy a whole mini fridge just for a tiny little thing of solder paste. So we're gonna get a little makeup fridge and put it out here just to keep solder paste cold. Also, it's gonna be good to get solder paste out of my actual fridge I use for food. <laughs> All right, cool, so solder paste is taken care of. The next step is the actual SMT assembly. Over the last couple weeks, I've been cleaning up a lot of little things about the index that need to be ready so that we can just dive straight into SMT assembly, and we're there. The first of these is addressing the floppy cable problem. I'm sure many of you have noticed in previous videos how much the floppy cables hinder the machine's motion and get in the way and sometimes even get all the way down to the staging plate. It's obviously a problem and it's one that I fixed. I spent a lot of time looking into how people solve the cable management problem of a CNC machine. It is kind of a weird thing. You have to be able to send power to a thing that moves around and a moderately large range too. Companies like Ultimaker can solve it by just having the PTFE Bowden tube and making sure that they're mounted with an axis as opposed to just a point mounting where it can rotate all around. They mount them kind of uh, with an axis in mind and that makes sure that no matter where you move it, it still always stays a nice bow and it works super well. Well, we have a really, really long area that we're expanding this to. We have about a little over 400 millimeters of motion in both axes. And trying to get a good number of cables and some PU tubing and a whole bunch of other stuff Traveling that whole distance is no small feat. The most common solution here is cable chain, and that definitely would solve this problem. Provided that we have the right cables in there that are able to handle that kind of flexing over and over again, we're all squared away. However, I am really trying to keep the sides of the machine open for future conveyor belt support, and I cannot figure out a way to cleanly have cable chain manage all these umbilicals while also keeping the sides open for boards coming in and out of the conveyor belt. I try to maybe a dozen different materials for how to keep the umbilical still there, but just staying upright, staying in a nice U, and I couldn't find something that worked reliably. One thing that I didn't try is what E3D uses for their tool changer platform, which looks like just a bent piece of spring steel, and I think that might work pretty well, but I didn't get around to trying that. If you have experience with trying that, let me know in the comments, I'm curious how that might work here, but I found a different solution. I stumbled upon a way that a number of CNC machines hold their vacuum tube uh, that actually clears away the chips from the, the tool head. It's effectively a really fancy swivel arm that keeps the tube out of the way of the machine's motion, but still lets it kind of track with wherever the, the head needs to go. So I busted out a quick prototype of exactly this, and it actually did a really good job of keeping the umbilical out of the way. This piece just replaces the umbilical mount that goes onto the frame of the machine, and this is just 
like a hockey stick piece that literally just drops into the hole and it's free to swivel around. And this is what you can zip tie the umbilical cables to. It works really well. At least it did for this section of the umbilical. The rest of it still was kind of sagging down. But this quick validation print proved to me that it was worth continuing to refine the design and maybe add an extra joint. So that's exactly what I did. I designed a little bit of extra stuff on top of it, made an extra joint to extend the support for the umbilical a little farther out. And that's what we got on the machine right now. I've been using it for the past week or so and it works like a dream. It's really great. It keeps the cables completely out of the way. It bows to the side when you move the head all the way up to the front. It just pivots to the front, keeps the cables out of the way, never goes down to the staging plate. It's fantastic. And it only adds one nut and one bolt to the bill of materials, so I'm stoked. One problem I did have with it is as the Y gantry can move towards the front of the machine, if the swivel is pointing kind of backwards, it can jam and it'll keep the Y gantry from moving all the way forward and hitting the limit switch. So I integrated little stops to the inside of this tube on later revisions that keep the, the swivel from rotating that far. So no matter what, it will never get to a position that the Y gantry can't just push it back to perpendicular and it homes no problem. It still does have a little bit of sag near the head, and I am thinking about adding a third section to this, but honestly, I don't know if it's necessary. It never gets all the way down to the point where it touches the staging plate or anything, and it does give a lot of flexibility for where the head moves and having a little bit of extra space for the PU tubing to reach the uh, rotation stepper, so I think it works great as is. But we'll see, I might try a third joint and see how that changes things. The second thing we needed to add to the index was proper cables. Making cable harnesses sucks a lot. Solution sourced all 11 cable harnesses that we need for the machine, all the perfect length and with the correct connectors on both ends. Having custom cable harnesses means things are so much more organized and much easier to route through the umbilical sheath. Plus we got all of them labeled. So when it comes time to actually plug them into the motherboard, it makes it super clear where everything needs to go. The last thing that needed to be added to the machine was strip feeders. We do have a decent powered feeder design out there right now and we have used it to supply parts for the machine before, but it's not close enough to done that I want to build up a dozen of them right now. So in the meantime, I've designed and printed strip feeders, which are effectively trays that hold component tape and in some situations the actual chip themselves at the perfect height for the nozzle to be able to access them and pick up the part. I mounted two more staging plates onto this machine and put all the strip feeders necessary to hold all the components needed to make motherboards. Surprisingly, I'm actually able to populate an entire motherboard panel using only one index. I'm not sure if I just did my math wrong before or I grossly overestimated how much space tape would take up, but I only need one, not three. So that's fantastic. <laughs> I'm really excited about that. I made three just for making motherboards and I only need one. So now we have two extras that we can set in parallel, also making motherboards in their entirety. I'm stoked about that. The second main chunk of time that I spent working on the machine, not on upgrades, was instead on OpenPNP configuration. I've had a pretty decent profile for the index in OpenPNP for a while now. I've used it for populating ring lights before. I used it for setting up two feeders being communicated through the motherboard. And I've had it set up pretty darn well for a good minute. And a lot of that configuration is done, but that's just the machine configuration. That stuff doesn't change too much. You still need to do some calibration for the cameras and stuff, but that stuff's pretty stable. The biggest task was setting up all the components, getting them imported, getting the locations of all the strip feeders imported, configuring the parts nozzle compatibility, and most of all, trying to get all the vision pipeline stuff for bottom vision that looks up to the part after the nozzles picked it, getting all that squared away, that's a beast. I'm actually still working on that right now and it's a lot. The last thing we had to do to get all the index set up to be populating boards actively is getting them computers to run them. I've been working off of my Mac this whole time, but I don't want to have my Mac tied to all of these things all the time. So Lucian and I figured we should probably get some dedicated computers to be running these machines. Lucian found someone that refurbishes old laptops that don't come with any batteries or hard drives, but they're for a steal. So we got three beater old laptops in, we got three power supplies and three hard drives. We put Ubuntu on them, we installed OpenPMP, and now we have three dedicated computers for running three dedicated indexes. It was pretty cool setting up like company laptops to be running production. That was a fun day setting that up. That was a total blast. Ultimately, because we discovered that really you can just use one index to populate the motherboards, we'll probably ultimately also run a second index from running motherboards so we can have two at the same time, both producing panels of two each. And then the third one will be doing ring lights. They're pretty simple boards and there's a bunch of boards per panel. So we can set it up and pretty much just let that one run while the other two motherboards are running. And I think we'll come out flush with two ring lights per motherboard. But we'll have to see with some testing. This is just conjecture until we actually run it and check the cycle time and all that stuff, 
We don't know for sure. And then of course, the third and final step of the process is reflow. I've always just taken my boards, tossed them in a toaster oven, turned it on high for two minutes and hope for the best. But that is absolutely not gonna cut it here. We need a repeatable, consistent process that's gonna conform to the solder paste recommended profile. We need something that's gonna be reliable and we know is going to create a good product and isn't going to blow out a chip or not completely solder something. We want this to be a, a tool and not a project. To solve this, I bought a Reflow Master from Sion, the unexpected maker. I'll link to his channel in the description. Also, here's a card here you can link and go check out his channel. He does really cool work. He does a lot of at-home SMT assembly. He's also a really cool dude. I think of the Reflow Master as effectively a replacement brain for a toaster oven, except it's got its mind on SMT assembly instead of toast. His kit was super easy to put together, and especially in context of brain surgery, this was really easy to do. I just set my toaster over settings to on and high, and then I use a solid state relay to turn it on and off, and that's how the Reflow Master is able to control temperature. I actually already had an extension cable with a solid state relay connected to it, so I just wired my toaster oven up to that, and then I connected the appropriate pins from the Reflow Master board to that solid state relay, and suddenly it has control of heating. Pretty cool. Then I mounted the thermocouple inside of the toaster oven along with cutting a hole for a fan. The point of the fan is so that you can cool down the board at the rate that's recommended by the solder paste profile. You can open the door to cool off the board and the inside of the toaster oven pretty quickly, but I wanna be able to run these reflow jobs while I'm doing other things in the shop and I don't wanna have to worry about opening the door right then and there when it beeps at me too. So instead putting a fan on the back means that the reflow master can bring in a lot of cool air and cool down the ambient temperature inside and also the board and also be able to follow the temperature much closer to the recommended profile, which is exactly what we want. Then I printed out Sion's case design, got all the cable management squared away, and now I've got a little toaster oven for reflow. And the best part is it actually fits both sized panels. I was a little worried about this, but they fit no problem. I'm really excited. As it stands, this is what the line looks like right now. I'm deep into open PMP config land right now, and so far it's going great. It is a lot of manual entry and a lot of tuning vision pipelines to make sure that parts are recognized correctly, but it's an investment in being able to make these boards much quicker in the future. I've been doing a lot of test population and I'm really excited about how things are looking. There's also been a ton going on behind the scenes about making and shipping index kits, but that's for a later video. All right, that's it for this one. I have a Patreon, so if you'd like to help support me working on this project, there's a link in the description where you can become a patron. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. But before I go, I want to thank this video sponsor, PCBWay. PCBWay has been making all of the prototypes for all of the boards that we're using across the entire project. They've been incredibly consistent, and they always look absolutely beautiful. The panels that I'm working on populating of the motherboard right now are wonderful. When I submitted the design files for them to make it, they asked me a couple things about how I did the mouse bites, which I made a video about last time, and they gave me a little bit of clarification and they told me some optimal things that I could do to make it better, so they were super helpful in making sure that they understood what I was trying to do, and they gave me feedback on how to best do that, which was super helpful. If you're looking for a board shop, I highly recommend PCBWA. Thank you so much to PCBWA for sponsoring this video. but it's not following the recommended taste profile. Taste profile? <clears throat> All right, this is the main A-roll for uh, 86, which is about setting up an SMT line for mid-scale manufacturer. <clears throat> I've made 86 of these. This is gonna be my 86th video. That's weird.